Hello, and welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach, and psychotherapist, and yoga teacher. And on today's episode, we are interviewing Carrie Johnson, a Florida-based Jiva Mukti teacher, among many, many other things. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us. Let me tell our listeners about your bio. Okay. You are not just a Jiva Mukti yoga teacher. You're a mental health counselor like me. You are a daring way facilitator, a somatic experiencing therapist, and an entrepreneur. You're inspired by the beauty life has to offer, and you're fueled by the passionate love within your own heart. And you began practicing yoga in your early teens, and you've been teaching yoga since 2005. You are an advanced, experienced, registered yoga teacher and a Yoga Alliance continuing education provider, and you have completed your PhD in counseling and counselor education. You offer wholehearted, trauma-informed, mindfulness-based counseling, as well as national and international groups workshops and retreats y'all are going to want to connect with carrie after you hear our little chat and you can find her at mindful therapy with carrie k-e-r-i dot com for upcoming events and to stay connected with her carrie thank you so much for coming on emotional badass oh nikki thanks so much for having me i'm honored to be here Oh, I'm honored to have you. And I want to share with our listeners how we connected because I, I believe so much in this interconnected flow of how we all connect with each other. And when we're on this healing path, there's such a butterfly effect. So I want to thank Brian, mm-hmm. who I love and adore for going to your classes and telling me, <laughs> wow, you say things a lot like I do. And so kind of bringing us together and connecting us. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yay. So t- can you, so I have been going on and on on the show trying to promote yoga and all its goodness. And I am excited to have you on today to be able to talk about my very first love was Jiva Mukti before I knew what that mm-hmm. word meant, before I knew the different styles. It was all a bunch of just Sanskrit yoga mumbo jumbo to me, but I stumbled into <laughs> Jiva Mukti and it it's just it holds such a special place in my heart. So can you share with us what Jiva Mukti is and how you came to have this as your practice? Yeah, um, absolutely. So Jiva Mukti was also my first love. Mm. Um, and really what uh, kind of inspired me and to dive deeper into the exploration of myself, but most importantly, of my own personal spirituality. Um, so I always, I kind of like to define, not define, but kind of offer the idea that Jiva Mukti is a very ethical and spiritually based practice and school um, and method of yoga. Um, it's very traditional in a sense where it honors uh, teachers and lineage. It honors the traditional practice and philosophy um, of yoga as it came over from the East. Uh, Sharon Gannon and David Life are the co-founders of Jiva Mukti Yoga. I believe they founded it back in 1984. And I first came into it because um, my sister, who's 10 years my senior, um, introduced me to yoga when I was a teen back in the late 1990s. And we grew up in northern New Jersey. And Sharon and David G's yoga studio, the Jiva Mukti Yoga Studio, was in Manhattan in New York City. So my sister, she went to college at Columbia and discovered the Jiva Mukti Yoga Center. And after practicing with her, I remember visiting her at some point and we went into New York and went to the original uh, Jiva Mukti Yoga Studio. And I remember, so at this point, I think I might have still been in eighth grade, some, wow. some young age. <laughs> and um, and the incense and the chanting and the Sanskrit. And for me, it was this really transformative experience in the sense where I felt like I was transported to another plane. Um, It was one of the first places I really felt that I could be myself and I could be curious um, about 
spirituality and Eastern traditions. Um, and it also, at the time, came, I really dove into the practice. It became a really powerful healing journey um, to kind of direct me along the yoga route at, in some of my young youth, um, more in high school and such, I kind of went down the sex, drugs, rock and roll path and I was searching for something and uh, I realized that I was actually able to find part of that something through yoga and spiritual practice. So it really kind of shook me up and I like to say it saved my life and the Cuban Lipsy Method was a huge component of that saving Oh, you're giving me goosebumps because I also say, <laughs> yeah, I think yoga saved my life. I'm fascinated that you found it so young and then made your way <laughs> to a kind of traditional mental health training. I did it the opposite. I did a traditional counseling training and my first job was sucking the life out of me. I loved the work, but mm -hmm. it was absolutely sucking the life out of me. And the very mm -hmm. first thing I really did for myself in terms of self-care was start going to yoga. And the Jiva Mukti, I th I, when I look back at it, because I didn't understand this at the time, it held a space for me, it, my whole self, in a way that I don't think any modality before or any doctor or chiropractor or therapist, no one had ever held a space for me that incorporated my entire being physically, emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically like Jiva Mukti. Mm hmm. Exactly. And that's, I love hearing you say that because for me, I always said when I was going through grad school, um, yoga is what kept me sane. And I was in a mental health program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yes. But it really, it helped me stay connected to my core, my wholehearted self, as you said, all parts. Um, when things were getting stirred up, uh, and even before I got into, um, graduate school and on the mental health track because I kind of came around it, came to it in a roundabout kind of way. Yoga was always the foundation of which I was able to exist. And one of the things I love about Jiva Mukti, like you said, is that it does provide this environment for all aspects of the self. And I believe that has a lot to do with the structure of the method of Jiva Mukti Yoga. And so I'll even just start with, so Jiva Mukti, it's a Sanskrit term that we're using here. And to, to kind of just break it down a little bit, it's based on two Sanskrit terms as Jiva or Jivan, which is the individual soul, and then Mukti or Mukta, which is similar to the idea of moksha or liberation. And so a key theme of the Jiva Mukti Yoga School is living while liberated. And it's how do we experience liberation in a contemporary world as an individual sense of self. And one of the ways we do that is by connecting and remembering that the self is with a capital S and it's not limited to the skin encapsulated ego, um, but it's really kind of connected to all beings everywhere. What freaked me out about the practice at first was the chanting mm -hmm. Because I think, yeah. first of all, I, I, I'm a big believer that singing is a bigger, in front of people, is a bigger fear for people than even public speaking. And public speaking, mm -hmm. I think, is at the top of the, the public fears list. And so yeah. when I was invited to chant, even just an ohm in that first class, I think, I think I was so disconnected from my own childhood trauma that mm -hmm. chanting with people made me be in my body in a way that was at the time completely foreign to me. And it scared me and I felt so awkward. And I want to name that because I, I know that people listening to the show on the healing path will hear this and will seek Jiva Mukti out. And I don't want anybody mm -hmm. to go and get freaked out that first time and never go back like that, that freak out, <laughs> that panic <laughs> of I am, I'm in my body. I'm using my voice. People can hear me. I, I don't like how I sound all the self doubt that when you offer mm -hmm. yourself that practice, that's what helps us move through. And those are no longer fears that I have to deal with or feel anymore be, because in large part of Jiva Mukti. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, for me, one of the things I found really fascinating is how actually going through 
graduate school and becoming a therapist and doing my own personal work and working with others, it has transformed my teaching of yoga and the way that I offer and guide it. And one of the things that I offer is with chanting is chanting is an option, Mm -hmm. right? It's optional. It's not required. And the, the intention is to show up with your wholehearted self as you are. And as you show up is enough. And if today I feel like chanting, terrific. If I don't feel like chanting, wonderful. How do you still show up with your voice or not, but with the intention of being curious and willing to show up? I think mental health misses the importance of curiosity. Mm. Yeah. I, I think I'm really trying to hard. It's interesting. I find myself stumbling even just thinking about that because that feels really big. Um, and I guess curiosity is a core root of the work that I do. Um And I think a lot of that is based upon, so in the intro, you were talking about me as um, a Daring Way facilitator. Mm -hmm. And so what that is, is I've gone through Brene Brown's teacher training. Mm -hmm. And so I offer her work um, and really connect a lot of her work in pretty much everything I do. And so much of it, especially of the Rising Strong process, is about curiosity. Mm -hmm. And it's not about judging our experiences, whether we're talking about being on a yoga mat, driving our car, having a conversation with a partner, being in the therapist's office, like wherever it is, it's how do we not judge our experience? Rather, how do we open ourselves to be curious about our experience? Um, and I think that permission is is a necessary ingredient, ingredient of no matter what we're doing. I think it's absolutely necessary. I think often what highly sensitive people and trauma survivors are doing is learning how to process the world through curiosity instead of through fear. Because we're such natural observers, we notice so much that if we're not bringing curiosity to it, I think it's so easy to slip into fear or judgment. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think without curiosity, that's so much where shame-based culture comes from in the sense where oh, I don't look this way, I didn't behave this way, I responded this way and not that way, I'm wrong, I should have done it this way, should have done it that way. And it's like, instead of going into that place of a dichotomy of right or wrong, how is it that we can get curious? Huh, I, I want to get curious about how I responded in this way or how did this pose feel in my body or why did was my breath short when I was trying to have this conversation or... I'm trying to speak my truth and confront something that feels uncomfortable with a partner and I'm realizing I have tightness in my chest and my throat. How do I get curious? Instead of it feeling like it has to be prescriptive of tightness in my throat, heaviness in my chest equals some diagnosis or means something or I unrepress something. It's like, "Mm, how can it just be a place where I get curious about the different things that it's related to? Because my guess is it's not just one thing our experiences are related to, but the interconnected web of everything. Oh, yes. And I don't know if we're going to go here today, but I'm so grateful and I want to acknowledge this that you mentioned sex drugs and sex drugs and rock and roll <laughs> because mm-hmm. I haven't figured out how to sort of address that aspect of myself in my history on the show. And I think mm-hmm. what you just said is very key to exploring you know, the, the parts of us that maybe are in our proudest moments or the things that maybe we would never do again, but we did do to be able to process mm-hmm. that history fairly to ourselves. I think we've got to bring curiosity to it. Absolutely. And for me, that's where I think the the art of mindfulness comes in. And when I'm using that term, I'm really leaning on John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, which is paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Yes. And for me, yoga practice really helps with all of the first components of that. Pay attention, sure. On purpose, you got it. The non-judgmentally part, that came later on in life for me. And it's really, like you said, of these might not necessarily be moments that I'm proud of, or maybe they were a part of my identity that really were protective measures, and they were helping me stay safe. And in different times when I was pretty much just in chronic trauma response. 
And so if it, if we can get notice the different nuances of what's involved, the different behaviors or responses or actions or even thoughts or feelings, then it can come to a place where we can potentially move through them instead of constantly being dictated by them. Yes, beautiful. Can you talk the listeners through the difference between a Jiva Muti class and maybe like a Hatha yoga class? Yeah, absolutely. So Jiva Mukti yoga um, has, I'll start with, it has five key tenets that the school and the practice it incorporates and is based off of. And the first tenet is ahimsa, which means nonviolence. So again, that's kind of where the ethical components of the practice really comes in. Um, then there's bhakti devotion, and that's where a lot of the kirtan or that call and response chanting um, comes in. Then there's dhyana, which is meditation, and often there will be more extended breath work or meditation components of the practice besides just the full on the muscle flowing movement posture to posture through the practice. And then the fourth component is nada, which is uh, sound and silence. And so it's this idea of how do we, um, if we circle back to Patanjali's yoga sutras, which are pretty much kind of some fundamental text or I'll say foundational text of yoga philosophy and practice, it really starts with the idea of yoga chitta vritti narodaha. And I know that's a whole bunch of Sanskrit perhaps jargon for some, but it means yoga is the cessation of the fluctuation of the mind. And so often, especially in our contemporary modernized world, Yoga has come to mean a particular posture. It might has, it might have even come to mean a particular brand of clothing Mm -hmm. or it needs to look a certain way. But really all of that is one small component of yoga philosophy and practice, the movement or the asana component. Everything else is about how do we use movement to help create comfort in the body so that we can quiet and still the mind. And then lastly is about scripture. And so that's where, again, referring to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads, uh, there are all these kind of different traditional ancient texts that really create kind of the, the heart and soul of the practice. But one of the things that Sharon G. and David G. talk about is that we really need to create a method that's available for the contemporary practitioner, right? Sure, it would be wonderful to be able to go on very extended meditation retreats or go on long yoga retreats and and all of these various things, travel the world, spend months and months in India or Tibet or China or Nepal, but it might not be quite realistic for us to be able to do that regularly or perhaps even at all. How do we be able to offer these practices true to their original essence, but for the contemporary practitioner. So that's just kind of some of the philosophy and understanding behind the Jiva Mukti Yoga method. So when you go into a classroom at Jiva Mukti Yoga, there's particular studios that are only Jiva Mukti Yoga studios. And then there's the Jiva Mukti classes that you might be able to go to that are um, at any yoga studio. Um, and it often will start out with some grounding and arising, some breathing. Then you'll probably end up chanting OM or a few other different variations of some form of Sanskrit um, or even English chant. And then again, there might be some breath work, some meditation, and then there'll be some movement. So the Jivamukhi Yoga method is very influenced by Ashtanga Yoga because Sri K. Patabi Joyce, the founder of Ashtanga Yoga, was one of Sharon G. and David G.'s original gurus or teachers. So it's going to have that kind of flowing pace um, of you hold a posture and then you move through a posture. And then it will have, it'll cover a whole bunch of different sequence of postures. So it's going to include probably standing and balancing and forward folds and twists and inversions and maybe a peak pose or an arm balance. And then it will end with a really nice, ideally, long shavasana. And then again, some meditation and chanting at the end. 
So it kind of really creates this whole body practice. And then throughout the practice, the teacher weaves together um, different inspirations uh, that can help guide the student throughout the practice. And that's one of the other kind of aspects of Jiva Mukti Yoga that I really love is there's always a what's called a focus of the month. And so this is kind of where a lot of the anchor um, of the practice can connect all of the teachers. So there's always a focus of the month, but it's going to have the individual teacher's unique perspective of it. So, for example, we're in the month of July right now when we're recording and having this lovely conversation. And the focus is, with time, magic arises. Ooh. And so there's, yeah, right? And so there's this whole kind of uh, little blog or writing that Sharon G. did of it. And there's different authors that do the focus of the month. Typically, in the past, or historically, I'll say, it's been either Sharon or David. And now they're kind of expanding out to some of their other senior teachers. And it really creates this opportunity of going deeper into the practice. So I've had the pleasure of practicing Jiva Mukti Yoga all over the States and um, in Germany. And it there's ways that no matter who's teaching the class, there's some anchor that connects you to all Jiva Mukti Yoga practitioners and teachers. So it's this really lovely um, way that I feel connected, not just with the students in the class or the teacher in the class or the studio here, even this town, but remembering that this is an international method in school where people all over the world are having conversations in some form or fashion that's connected to this topic. Well, no wonder I have felt so deeply connected with, <laughs> within these yoga classes. I, I always think of Jiva Mukti as completely balanced inside and out, like top to bottom. So it's because it's a strong practice. It's a very like strong yep. strength building practice, but it's also balanced with stillness and internal and external. So I just feel so completely like on a cellular and spiritual level taken care of from the top to the bottom. Yeah. I'm um, well, I'm glad to hear. I, I share a very similar experience when I practice and teach Jiva Mukti. Let's talk a little bit about how we're both having wrist injuries and how the practice helps us learn how to meet ourselves right where we are. Because you were mentioning before we started recording that you have been going down on your fists instead of wrists. And by chance, I've been practicing in the very same way, nursing some wrist things as I get older. Yeah. Well, and I, for me, I really feel that this is um, a lot of the shifts uh, of my counseling experience and training okay. and really um, just giving permission for my body to show up as it is and that being enough. Um, I think one of the things for me, it's been a big learning curve because I um, I started practicing yoga so young, I had this experience of hyper flexibility, but not necessarily strength in all areas um, to really support that flexibility. So it's something based upon injuries that I really had to back out of poses to really focus deeply on how to develop that internal strength and stability of particular muscle groups to support that flexibility that's inherent in my body. Yes. Um, so listeners, the the point that Carrie is making it. So when you watch yoga practitioners, and I know a lot of people hold back wanting to be extra flexible before they go to yoga and yoga is really there to meet every single body. What we tend to see as yoga practitioners is that bodies tend to lean one of two ways to me. They're either sort of naturally super flexible or naturally super strong and not so flexible. I happen to have a body that when I began yoga, I could barely bend over and my my hands would barely go past my knees. I was so mm -hmm. stiff, but I've always been very strong and muscular. 
So mm-hmm. when people are naturally flexible, sometimes they over bend, they get very bendy, like a rubber band because they have the natural flex, but they might not have the strength to support the body in that flex. So they can become what we call hyper mobile and have some issues from that. So I feel like my body has sort of saved me in that way that I couldn't over bend because of sort of my natural stiffness. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is where I really feel the permission and the mindfulness and the curiosity and non-judgmental piece comes in because it's how do we show up as we are in the container that we're in and have that be enough. And instead of thinking, and I think this is one of the potential, dare I say, dangers of how contemporary and kind of commodified yes. yoga has become in a sense where often when we think of yoga or when I think of yoga, it's it, often there's like an asana or a particular posture or form. And perhaps my body can mo- uh, model that form or perhaps it can't. And then sometimes when I start thinking of like, oh, well, yoga is this posture. But what if I can't do that? Do, am I a bad yogi? Or it, it, should I force my body to do this? And I really feel that's where the permission comes in of showing up and modifying. And as a yoga teacher, I actually find it really important when I'm taking a class with other students, when I know that they know I'm a teacher at that studio, I think it's really important that I do modify. Mm -hmm. And if my body's requesting a modification, because I really feel, especially as teachers, we have potentially this role where we're literally role modeling what yoga can look like on a yoga mat and off a yoga mat so that when we're giving ourselves permission to modify and maybe take a child pose or for me when I go on my fist instead of having my palms down and maybe I hold plank or I lower knees chest chin instead of doing a chaturanga all of those various things those potentially are being picked up by other people of oh if a teacher can modify, maybe I can too. And so I think it's an important mirroring that we can do. And I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've run into students where they're um, hesitant to use props, specifically blocks. And when I have that sense that there might be a hesitation about using a prop, I, I like to remind folks that yo- a yoga mat is a prop too, you know, and and so how is it that, let's say, for triangle, for example, instead of having your hand on your shin, when maybe you can't reach the floor, but if you have your hand on your shin, you have a tendency to hyperextend your front leg, well, let's use the block. Let's draw the earth closer to you because then it's figuring out where we can release some of the struggle so that we can be maintaining alignment and structural stability to help for the longevity of the practice. Yes, I what you're naming is really important. So for me, I've thought about this a lot over the years, personally and professionally. And I think what we see there in the resistance to use the props, and by props, we're talking about blocks and blankets and straps to actually prop and support and help the body and help it be easier. All of us walk around consciously wanting life to be easier, but then we don't really pay attention to how we disallow life to be easier and ourselves to be supported. So I think part of why we see that resistance to using the props, even when the teacher in class is saying over and over again, use the props, use the props, get some help, grab a block, and just you look around and people are struggling and they're not utilizing that help. I think that's where we are in the world. I think it's the reflection of that, that we are so overworked, we are so overstimulated, we are trying to plow through and get things done and do all the things that we're just sort of plowing through ourselves and our lives and our moments. And it it, it was a big shift for me, a very conscious shift when I stopped resisting the props. It's like it clicked together for me that I had been so unsupported in a lot of my life oh, that I didn't know how to support yes. myself in my body in that yoga class. So that permission really sort of up leveled my internal healing. Absolutely. Well, and I love one of the key words that really stood out in what you were sharing right there for me was support, mm-hmm. right? I feel so often we're wanting to go it alone, right? And again, circling 
back to some of Brene Brown's work, when she talked about the myths of vulnerability, one of the, well, the first vulnerability myth is that vulnerability is weakness, which mm-hmm. is just absolutely not true. And then the second one is that I can go it alone, right? But we're required, we're biologically wired for connection. And with that connection comes support. So how is it that we can kind of figure out? And I know for me, I have tendencies to work a lot. I have tendencies to feel like I need to go it alone and I need to do it by myself and I have a hard time asking for help. But those are things that I've really been conscious about working on. And I'll even say when I'm having a conversation with a friend or a partner or something uh, or a family member of, hey, I'm working on asking for help. And here's me asking for help. Something I'm, you know, so it's naming something that I'm working on because I feel we don't give ourselves permission to ask for the support and help that we need. Well, and I, I am totally on board with what you're saying, but I think it goes even deeper than that. I think so many of us have asked for help historically and received mm. shame or just received silence and nothingness that, so I think a lot of times what we're battling is logic versus the wisdom of vulnerability because logically if i've asked for help a lot and i haven't gotten it or i've received shame when i've asked for help it makes sense that logically i would get to the place of well then i just won't ask for help that's what will protect me and it's not a wrong assumption in terms of logic but so much of our emotional spiritual humanness doesn't benefit from that simple brain logic we have to go a little deeper and so i think we're we're allowing for for more support when we realize we can have support but often that's the block that i that i know myself and many of my clients have had to push through over the years is is the the flawed help or the the shame they've received instead of that help so it's a breakthrough moment if you can go to a yoga class know that that's part of your history and when that teacher invites you to use that block just to allow yourself to reach out and go yeah I might not need it but I can have it yep exactly and one of the things that comes up when you were talking for me is the courage it takes to show up and ask for a block or ask for support or ask for help especially if we have that history of feeling shamed for it because I absolutely feel that there's a lot of stigma on asking for help because our society seems to reward the individuals that can just take care of it and do business on their own and work all the time and create all of this, but it it doesn't create that work-life balance. So I really feel that there's an inherent courage in asking for help and asking for the support that would help feel good. And I think for me, one of the things that I've really been talking about in my yoga classes recently is take what you need and leave the rest. Oh, yeah. One of my phrases. (laughs) Yeah, right? So for me, it's like, sure, my body potentially can do that pose. I know I can. I actually feel open and warmed up enough for it. But I just really don't see, like, it doesn't feel like it would be helpful. It feels like maybe it would be more harmful or maybe it feels like my ego is saying that, yeah, I can do that fancy arm balance or sure, I can do an inversion right now. But if I were really to check in, maybe I'm wanting more of a yin or restorative practice. And maybe instead of doing that, I'm actually going to go down a child's pose. Ooh, you're talking emotional boundaries with yourself where that really mm-hmm. is the boundary of no, I don't need to do that today. And I can tell my own ego, no. I think it's so important that we model that as teachers and therapists. And I think historically in therapy for me, therapists have modeled perfection. Mm. (laughs) Yep. And so it's been very important to me as a yogi and as a mentor, healer, therapist, life coach Mm -hmm. to really model that, no, I am a, I am a messy, flawed human being that is figuring things out as she goes because there is no other truth 
other than that till the yeah. day I am buried that that will be my story my play my growth edge and I think that's true for mm-hmm. all of us we just don't have it I think honored and and spoken it's like the great unspoken truth I think in past generations that this these generations now are starting to step into how imperfect how perfectly imperfect we all are yeah and I really feel that it it for me, I've had to really navigate and let go of the word perfect and perfection and just giving permission for the imperfections of me. And like you said, it's the perfectly imperfect. It, it, um, cause I feel when I was always striving for something, I didn't really realize that it was for perfection, but what I was realizing is it was for others approval Mm -hmm. and, and I really feel in um, that in, and this is again coming from Brene, but the her research talks about perfectionism is other focused where healthy striving is self focused. Yes. So I can work on wanting to, get deeper accessibility in a particular posture, or I can stay committed to a meditation practice or a spiritual practice or a chanting practice. And it can all be for my own personal kind of experience and growth and development and relationship to myself. And it's all about that self-growth versus I feel if I am trying to perfect a pose one day maybe it's going to be on the cover of yoga journal or something well no that's for other approval and that's where i really feel the other approval gets incredibly toxic for us honoring our own personal boundaries oh, we're not yeah. listening to ourselves at all oh yeah well and it's i always make the joke like it's that's why it's not other esteem it's self esteem we've got to do the work on the inside right there's no other esteem that's why it doesn't work that's why so many of us are such high achievers like I've read I've read in your intro all the things you've done I was like oh I'm talking to a fellow overachiever here (laughs) and we all struggle with the perfectionism right like we're all we're all learning how to let go of that kind of approval oh Carrie Johnson thank you so much for being on the show with me today Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Is there anything that you would like to share with your listeners? Do you have a group or a retreat or anything coming up that you would like to share and promote and shout out to the universe? Yes. Um, So some of my uh, heart and soul work is what's called Rising Strong Through the Chakras. And so it incorporates Brene Brown's Rising Strong process with chakra yoga and chakra healing. And so I have two retreats coming up this fall, one in Peru, uh, October 5th through 12th, and then one in Isle Morata, Florida, so Florida Keys, in December of this year, and that's December 5th through 11th. And you can find out all that information at my website at mindfultherapywithcarry.com. Yay, and we will have this information in the show notes so that you can find it and click on it if you're listening and not writing it down. So that'll be there for you. Carrie, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. So again, I want to thank Carrie Johnson. She's in Gainesville, Florida. She's a Jiva Mukti teacher, a mental health counselor, a Daring Way facilitator. She does so many things. Go check out her retreats. Go follow her. If you're in Gainesville, go check her out and enjoy her loving soul care yoga class. Carrie is an emotional badass. I am an emotional badass and you sweet listeners are emotional badasses. I will see you next week. Take care.